Please welcome to our stage Reverend Beverly Dempsey with the John Hoos Presbyterian Church with today's invocation. I think this is, yes, let us pray. Spirit of creation, author and finisher of all life, we praise you for this glorious day. We thank you for the opportunity that we share to discuss the state of this district, a privilege earned by people coming to this country from all other lands who knew firsthand that this privilege is not shared by all. As we deliberate over what is best for your people, help us consider first the most vulnerable among us, especially the elderly and the children, those who are homeless and those who are suffering from food insecurity. We ask that you enrich us with your truth, inspire us to dream, and instill in us a fervor for justice that all people will be, for all people that someday the sick will be healed, the wounded will be made whole, the downcast will be uplifted, the poor will be rich, the outcast will be included, the frightened will be emboldened, the enslaved will be set free, and all people will know your love. These things we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we ask you to please rise and welcome these talented students from Talented Unlimited High School who will lead us in the national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rita Popper. If by Rudyard Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all people doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, 
and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap of fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with one-hour tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on where there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, not lose a common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all people count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a, you'll be a person of character. Thank you, Rita. Please welcome to the stage Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Hello, I'm so delighted to be home and not in Washington and able to be here with my friends and colleagues and people that I have the privilege of representing. First of all, I want to thank you not only for coming today, and I see our esteemed, uh, dedicated Burr president. Uh, thank you so much for coming. We'll be hearing from her soon. But I wanted to thank you for electing Ben Kalos, because he truly is a dedicated, uh, uh, determined, and effective uh, member of the city council and really a, a rock to lean on when I'm in Congress knowing that he's here taking care of what needs to be taken care of and representing really the concerns being your voice of the neighborhood at City Hall. Uh, he sort of reminds me of this story that this minister told me one time that he would go to church every day and there was this, or Sundays, and there was this guy who would always stand up at the end of the service and say, use me Lord, use me. And so he kept saying this every Sunday. So finally, the minister went over. He says, okay, we want to use you. You really want to be used? He said, yes. He said, what I would like you to, these pews are in bad shape. They need to be sanded and painted and, and, and made looking lively for, for the summertime services. And he said, sure, you know. So then he came back, and, and he, this went on forever. The guy kept saying, use me, use me. But he wasn't doing anything with the pews. So finally, the minister talked to him. He said, well, you said to use me. He said, but I wanted to be used in an advisory capacity. <laughs> and I would say, luckily for the east side, there is nothing advisory about Ben Kalos. He is hands-on. He gets the job done. I'm just going to give one example. Uh, uh, with his predecessor, Jessica Lappin, we formed an uh, an esplanade committee but because our waterfront was not being beautified and uh, we wanted everybody, all of you, to be able to walk and enjoy the water and be part of it. So we formed this, this esplanade committee and when she went on to other things because of term limits, he came in as the co-chair with me. And uh, not only has he worked hand in hand with me on everything we did and we got uh, huge grants from the government. One of them was $700 million from, from the mayor and others because it was a joint product and project that we all wanted to do. But he showed tremendous uh, creativity in uh, speaking out to the businesses along the Esplanade and getting them to repair it too. And if you notice the 67th Street, 62nd Street park that we have now is not, not beautiful. And also the pier by, by uh, Gracie Mansion. All of these things were 
products that we did, all of us working together on the city, state, and federal uh, level, so that we have the money in place or pledged now to complete the whole esplanade in the district that he and I are privileged to represent. And I think that's a real concrete um, a achievement uh, for this neighborhood. Uh, he also was a, a great partner on the Second Avenue subway. How many of you been on that Second Avenue subway? That that is my uh, prime uh, focus. Oh, you should have applauded on the Esplanade. That was a big effort too. I mean, that was a big effort. And uh, he he's also been there. We had opened that up uh, not this Christmas, but last uh, New Year's Eve, and it uh, I believe is the finest subway in the whole country. And we now need to build it up to 125th Street and down to uh, the tip of Manhattan eventually. Uh, but if you haven't ridden on it, you ought to get on it and just ride because it's just beautiful. And it's quiet, it's state-of-the-art technology, lighting. They even have art in it. It is really an experience. Sometimes uh, I, I just get on it and ride just to enjoy it. But I, I, he's an extraordinary person, but I, I just wanted to mention, because I've been here and everybody's asking me about the shutdown. And uh, this is the longest shutdown in our nation's history, 22 days and counting. And right before I came here, I, I was at a meeting that Nydia Velasquez and I had with federal workers that have lost their pay. They don't know how they're going to buy their food or take care of their mortgage or do anything else. It is a disaster. And it was caused uh, uh, willfully, recklessly, and single-handedly by the President of the United States in pursuit of a boondoggle that the majority of the American people absolutely oppose. Building a wall that won't work to address a crisis that isn't real so he can keep a promise that wasn't true. Uh, this is just ridiculous, and the consequences are very severe, as I said. Now, there are other, we all support border security, but the truth is, in these designated crossings is where most of the drugs and illegal activity happens. So we need scanners on cars and technology and drones and uh, not a wall that you can jump over or climb over or dig under or put a hole through and get through. And we need to address the concerns of the people that, are, that have this. And I, I would say one of the biggest downs that I've had in government is when they were se separating families at the border. Uh, just absolutely inhumane to take children, small children, away from their parents. So we in Congress are now working to unite the families, uh, take care of the children at the border, incre increase border security in a, in a 21st century way. The Maginot Line didn't work too well in France. Uh, some of these walls just don't work. You need other things to secure the border security. And, and we're working on all of those and uh, moving forward. Many of you have asked me about, about the Mueller Commission the, since when I came here. And the Mueller Commission uh, was a real effort. It was bipartisan, actually, uh, and that we all worked to get him uh, appointed. Then we worked to give him independence, to give him subpoena power, to give him the money to conduct his investigation and as much time as he needs. The allegations of a foreign power um, influencing our elections is probably one of the most serious uh, crimes or allegations of a crime that I've ever witnessed. But we need to let him be a professional and complete his job. He has to complete his investigation. Then he is to, supposed to write a, a report to Congress. And then, believe me, Congress will react, have uh, hearings on what is found, have deliberations, and will move forward, hopefully, in a productive way uh, for uh, for our country based on what comes out of the Mueller investigation. But Congress is moving forward right now, not only in helping people, we're having hearings on the high cost of prescription drugs, on lowering the cost of health care, and also in exercising oversight, which is our responsibility. We're Article I of the, of the Constitution, co-equal with the executive. But in the past two years, they did not conduct any oversight of the president. So we are now having oversight hearings of activities. I want to share with you that the Democrats requested, just in one committee that I'm on, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, they requested 65 subpoenas, all of which they turned down on various areas. 
but the first oversight on the executive will be uh, with uh, Michael Cohen, the president's fixer and fixer-upper and uh, taking care of his scandals and all that. He's the person who's going to be testifying on February 7th before the committee. So we are serious about moving forward. Our first bill that we are going to pass is Intro 1. And this is a bill that is dedicated to ending the dark money in politics. The minute that Citizens United passed, uh, there was $44 million in money in congressional, print, uh, congressional races. This year, because of Citizens United and this outside money that can come in that no one even knows where it came from, $144 billion was spent in this last election cycle. Just amazing amount of money. Gratefully, I am at least grateful that the Democrats now have a majority in the House so that we can conduct oversight and take care of our responsibilities. But I would not be able to do my job in Washington if Ben Kalos wasn't doing his job here because many of you know that I was a former city council member and I uh, was very close to the community. So if the community doesn't like anything, my phone starts ringing. They start ringing, you know, he's not at the meeting, they, he has a position that's different from ours, and where is our voice? You endorse this person, we voted for him, they're not doing the right job. I never hear that about Ben Kalos. All I hear is that he's on the job, he's getting it done, he's listening to the community, taking their concerns and priorities and being a true servant, which is what an elected official is to the community that he represents. And I would say that the most honorable profession that you could ever be in, if it's done honestly and wisely and fairly for the people, is elected office because you can have such a great impact on marshalling resources and or stopping bad things from happening, like the overbuilding on 108 East 96th Street. Remember when they, they built 17 illegal stories and we had to tear them all down? So watching what needs to be done. And I would say that Ben Kalos is a, an incredible uh, public servant, uh, and I am so thrilled to be on his team, uh, working with him on the issues in the community, and then the broader issues, the policy issues that we are working so hard to settle in other places. Thank you for being part of your democracy. Thank you for voting for him and supporting him. And thank you for being on his team uh, here to support the efforts of the work that you want done in the community. Thank you so much for having me here. I am thrilled to be here. I, I, I would like to have a similar thing on what's happening in Congress. I don't want to talk about it here because we want to talk about the great job that he's done in fire protection, police protection, uh, in, enforcing the laws, uh, improving the neighborhoods, uh, affordable housing, uh, making sure that uh, the, 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 the support is there to enforce the rent protection laws that we already have in place. He is an extraordinary, extraordinary public servant, an effective one. We are so lucky to have him, and I'm so lucky to be able to support him. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Borough President Gail Brewer. I should have introduced her, but there's not strong enough words to really introduce our Borough President. She is extraordinary. Uh, she is honest, hardworking. She gets the job done. Uh, I, I have the greatest admiration and respect and total trust in her judgment and everything that she's done. And uh, no one can outwork Gail Brewer, that's for sure, particularly for good and important uh, causes for our community. I am thrilled to be here to introduce our outstanding, truly outstanding Borough President. So good afternoon. It, I want to second the words of our wonderful Congress member saying how great uh, Ben Kalos is. I will say that he represents obviously the Upper East Side. He never forgets Roosevelt Island and he has like a tiny little part of East Harlem and that guy fights for those two goddamn little election districts or whatever they are just as strongly. So I love when we're at a town hall meeting and all the commissioners are there 
And he is buttonholing every single one of them to fight for all of us. And that's the kind of, as the council, Congress member said, that's the kind of person you want representing you. He uh, isn't afraid to take on big issues. He's super smart. He's super committed. We're really lucky. I'm lucky to have him as a partner. Carolyn Maloney's lucky to have him as a partner, and you're lucky to have him as your representative. I want to give you one example, which is the number of school seats. Like a dog with a bone, everywhere I went, he pointed out to the mayor and to the Department of Education the lack of pre-K and the lack of school seats. And I was supportive, but I can remember rec recently somebody coming up to me, Ben wasn't there, and said to me, there's only one person I trust in government. My daughter is in pre-K because of Ben Kalos, and nothing could mean more to me. That's the kind of elected official, and that's the kind of endorsement that all of us wish for. That's what means something, when it, it's personal, when it actually helps you, and that's what Ben does. He has also uh, engaged with healthy food preparation, with cooking with Kalos. I could not do that. I don't eat enough vegetables. I don't know how to cook them well enough. But he does. He takes on even something like that. And of course, he is. there's no issue that's too small and no issue that's too big for him to get something done. Um, in terms of just his raw intelligence and commitment, all the issues of zoning, we work together on these issues. That is the hardest issue in the city of New York land use, zoning, and affordable housing. Carolyn Maloney has hard issues in Washington, but these are really challenging, particularly here on the east side and throughout Manhattan. So the R10 Voluntary Inclusionary Program, making sure that developers who build tall buildings include more affordable housing. Always a challenge, Ben is always on top of it. We want to close zoning loopholes that allow buildings to go higher and allow stilts and allow mechanical voids that make no sense for those of you who are in the weeds and like the community board is, community board number eight and others. It makes no sense. He's on top of it. Is it a challenge? Absolutely, yes. Um, second, of course, is just the Roosevelt Island Library, which I know was started by uh, Jessica Lappin, but it is a library that everybody can be supportive of, but you only do that if you are involved with how it is going to be built. And if you spend time figuring out how to allocate funding, how it will double, double the library space, what are the concerns of the neighborhood, and making sure that you have a town hall meeting to discuss this, which is what he and the assembly member did. Every single project takes time. Um, we're all focused on John Jay Park. I know that um, there are wonderful friends of John Jay Park, but believe it or not, every greater grass in John Jay Park is contentious. But he has managed to figure out what makes sense to work with the community um, and in a way that is of importance to the, to the park. He worked on PSIS 217, the green roof and the STEM center. We worked together to figure out how it can be sustainable, how it can be built, how it can be funded. And again, when you're working with Ben Kalos, it's a pleasure for me because you have a true partner. You have somebody who's fighting for the same uh, agenda. He's also been working, we've been to working together with the other elected officials on the issue of homes. It's an infill project, I think we all know about it. We're very frustrated because these projects get built on NYCHA land without any input from the community, without any zoning input, without the Euler process, which is a process we use to build uh, whenever there is city input, when it's not on NYCHA. And to the credit of Ben, he is constantly bringing it up, doesn't Nothing uh, stirs him in a way that is pressure from developers in a way that should not be taking place. He is, engages effectively with NYCHA, with the local stakeholders, has a lot of respect for the residents, always. The other topic that he and I share is the issue of technology, civic hackathon, civic technology, ways in which the technology can help the community. I pretend I know something about technology because I was chair of the technology committee. I passed the open data bill. I believe in it. I go to all the civic hackathons. I'm part of civic, the civic world, but I don't know anything compared to Ben Kalo. So I listen to him very, very carefully. And I try to uh, follow his lead because he actually knows how 
what's behind some of these decisions and some of the technology choices. We're all advocating, of course, for much more municipal Wi-Fi and ways in which government can use technology more effectively. There's a lot of talk about it, but it's not always as operational as we would both like. Um, so, and also I just want to say, as you all do, he has a wonderful staff. The staff is responsive. We work together on legislation, on many of these different projects, which are complicated, many stakeholders, a lot of strong feelings about it, and we work together. We also work together on appointing to the community board, and we work together on how to fund many of these projects. His office is a beehive of activity. I don't know any other uh, state of the district that lists every single one of his first Friday, policy night, legal clinics, mobile hours, and there's probably much more condoms. I put condoms in my office because he has condoms in his office, you know. So there is no aspect of the community that he is not engaged in in a very positive way. So I'm here to say that he is the kind of elected official um, that all of us would like to be and that you should be very proud that he is your representative and in our midst. There are a lot of uh, council members, there are a lot of people representing this very, very fabulous city, but there aren't many who have this diverse aspect in terms of intelligence, commitment, and follow up and follow through. Nobody pays more attention, even when he was on paternity leave, he was on top of all the issues in the community. So I'm here to say thank you very much to my friend, my colleague, our colleague, our representative, Ben Kalos, and I hope he will come out now and give his state of the district. Let's hear it one more time for our Congress member and our Borough President, Gail Brewer. Good afternoon. If you've been to an event before, this is where I ask you to put more energy into it. Good afternoon. Amazing. I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, and I have the honor of representing over 168,000 New Yorkers on the Upper East Side, Midtown East, East Harlem, and Roosevelt Island for five years, 12 days, 13 hours, 39 minutes, and 46 seconds, but who's counting? This is by far the best job I have ever had, and every moment is a precious opportunity to make the world starting in our neighborhood and our city a better place. The best part of this job is getting to meet my neighbors, to work with local activists, faith leaders, educators, fellow elected officials, New Yorkers united in a common mission to make the world a better place, starting with its capital, New York City. And I want to give a special thank you to the participants in today's program, starting with Reverend Beverly Dempsey for today's invocation and for work she does every day at Yonhu's Presbyterian Church and the Urban Outreach Center in service of New Yorkers in need. Thank you to our incredible group of musicians and singers from Talent Unlimited High School, Jada Peralta, Mariah Goodridge, Taylor Salesman, Alexa Maldonado, Kendall Speaks, who will be filming their music director, Jane Skoog, and Principal UJ Viscolenolos. And of course, to Rita Popper for her wonderful reading of a 21st century version of If, written by Rudyard Kipling. When I joined Community Board 8, I was the uh, young troublemaker, but they didn't know anything until they met Rita Popper, who put me to shame in terms of troublemaking. I get to continue to work with her every day, and she inspires me and my fellow elected officials every day. We are so lucky to have our Congress member, Carol Maloney, in Congress, where she has taken back the majority. She's already done so much along the lines of credit card, bill of rights, helping so many people get out of financial trouble. And she, if, if there's a gun safety law, odds are she either wrote it or is sponsoring it. And now that we have Congress, I hope we can finally pass her gun safety package to keep children all over our country safe. I was going to thank our Borough President Gail Brewer, but she just gave my speech. 
so we can all go home now. But in, in, in all seriousness, uh, so much of what I do is inspired by our borough president. Uh, the bags you're going to get today are actually, her, her office helped us order those bags because she did it, I wanted to do it. We're gonna talk about our fresh food box. She has a senior food bag program right here in the district. I wanted to do that too. And uh, I know she hates when I say it, but I really do wanna be Gail when I grow up. <laughs> Thank you to the whole team here at Memorial Sloan Kettering for opening up this wonderful space for us to gather and stay warm today, including Phoebe Kemick, Shakima Grant, Ed Swisher, and Sam Palmucci. Most importantly, I'm honored by how many of you came out to share this Sunday afternoon with us, to reflect on the work that we've done together, and to look forward to everything we can accomplish in the year to come. Today I'll talk about resources available in my office, the investments we've made in school seats, how we've worked to improve commutes, rebuild our parks, improve quality of life, fight over development, build and preserve affordable housing, and reform our government elections to better serve you. I promise that if you're here just for the bagels and reusable bag, that's okay, we'll get to that soon enough. If this is your fifth state of the district, you've probably heard me tell that joke five times. <laughs> My office is the community's office and neighborhood center. I invite you to join me in person for the first Friday of each month from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Meet with my staff at policy night at 5 p.m. on the second Tuesday. Sign up for our free legal clinics on housing, family, and family law and domestic violence each month. We host monthly mobile office hours at senior centers and NYCHA to bring our office and services we provide directly to you. Most evening, my staff or I attend community board, precinct council, neighborhood association, and tent association meetings. Still not as many meetings as Gail Brewer because she is everywhere at all times. And during the spring and summer months on weekends, you'll find us at street fairs or, as mentioned, cooking with Kalos at green markets. You can even get some fresh fruits and veggies at our office during the summer and fall, thanks to our partnership with Grow NYC and the Fresh Food Box site at our office every Thursday. But all that forces you to come to us. So I even make house calls. We call it Ben in your building, where I can join you for your annual meeting. I also do weddings and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> Uh, seriously though, both Gail and I are registered marriage officiants uh, and neither of us charge. Uh, I believe I'm up to three weddings. Gail, how many are you up to? <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, since I ran for office, I said I wanted to change the fundamentals of government, how politicians are elected, how they're paid, who has the influence. To cut back on corruption and make our government responsive, only the people it represents, when I was elected, I promised to work only for you, so I refused tens of thousands of dollars in personal income called Lulu's offered for being a committee chair. Then I went further and wrote the law that made Lulu's illegal, as well as banning outside income and making the city council a full-time job. The New York Times recognized the council for its leadership and instituting in instituting these changes and recommended these reforms be replicated in Albany. Our controller, Scott Stringer, uh, passed it. Uh, our state senator, Liz Kruger, was one of the few elected officials who was entitled to a Lulu, I think of over $30,000. She's already refused it. And despite whatever happens in court, I hope that we see these same reforms in Albany. But I thank our state senator for doing them anyway. <laughs> To improve voter registration, we worked with the New York State Attorney General to author the law that will allow New Yorkers to register to vote online. And whether you're concerned about overdevelopment, lack of school seats, or anything else, your number one issue is really campaign finance reform. This is because politicians spend so much of their time asking for contributions of $5,100. That's more than you can give to the president, not that I would ever give to the president. Everyone expects something in return for their money. I once gave something to somebody worth thousands of dollars, and I expected her to spend the rest of her life with me. <laughs> she said yes, and we have a lovely daughter. But I've never thought anyone should be giving politicians that much money, and since I was elected, I've continued my decades-long fight to get big money out of city politics. Last session, I introduced campaign finance reform that would expand our public matching system. But even with the majority of sponsors in the city council, 
Somehow I didn't have the support to get it done. This year we worked with Mayor Bill de Blasio to steer campaign finance reforms around the city council and directly to the voters as ballot question one. In a historic turnout on election day this past November, New Yorkers voted overwhelmingly to support campaign finance reforms proposed on ballot question one. You and 1.1 million other New Yorkers from all five boroughs spoke loudly and clearly to get big money out of politics. The new system that I'm proud to have helped to usher in lowers contribution limits by more than a half from as much as $5,100 to $2,000, which is still too much, make small dollars more valuable by increasing their public match from six to eight, and increases the public grants from half the money candidates can spend to three quarters, eliminating the need for big dollars. When question one passed so overwhelmingly, I authored a law to implement these reforms immediately instead of waiting until 2021. That law passed last month and the program was signed into law on January 2nd. It's already up and running. I helped lead the yes, yes, yes campaign in favor of the ballot initiatives and question one wasn't the only victories. New Yorkers also voted to approve ballot questions two and three, which created a civic engagement commission, expanded participatory from my district and others to the rest of the city, and provide community boards with term limits and urban planners. I have funded urban planners for all of my community boards and now every board will have their own George Janes to take on developers and I'm gonna work with our borough president Gail Burr to make sure that that happens. Now, I believe in term limits at every level of government. I believe in term limits for the President of the United States. Oh boy, do I believe in those term limits. But I also believe in them for myself. And this reform will give more New Yorkers the opportunity to serve communities on these local boards. Please see Louisa Lopez after my speech at Borough President Gail Brewer's table about how to become a public member or apply to your community board. And please tell her I sent you. Uh, having successfully changed our charter at least last year, we're not done yet. I took some time to read through, section, through 3,103 sections of the charter and proposed 72 new charter reforms from giving communities a binding vote in the land use process to eliminating an absolute reference, obsolete reference to the telegraph. And I'll now read all 72 in their entirety. Now I'm joking, I only skimmed some places and I won't read them all but you can at bencalos.com slash charter2019. I wanna take a moment to thank Community Board 8 Manhattan and our Manhattan Borough President for convening a charter revision committee, and I hope you'll come testify and sum submit your own proposals. As a graduate of the Bronx High School of Science, I believe everybody deserves the same world-class education that I got, thank you to my fellow alum. After the launch of Universal Pre-Kindergarten, WNYC reported that our district only had 123 pre-K seats, and that was nowhere enough. After five years of advocacy, as our borough president mentioned, we now have 900 seats. This year, we cut the ribbon on two new facilities on 57th and 95th Streets, and we've broken ground on a new site on 76th Street that is on track to open by September. But the But the good news doesn't end at pre-K after years of advocacy and passing laws to track the number of children turned away. It helped prove our case and there are now 640 new grade school seats planned for the Upper East Side with $93 million in funding. Also fighting to bring 3K seats to our district as soon as possible. I've told the mayor that if we don't get 3K seats on the Upper East Side by 2021, he owes me $30,000 for my daughter. For years, the start of every school year has given parents nightmares when their children are stuck on buses for hours. Those nightmares reached a crisis level in November during winter storm Avery when Jennifer Reynoso, mother of a child receiving a special education, could not locate her child late at night in the snowstorm. I and my wife saw her in her child my own daughter and I immediately reached out to the mayor's office and we worked with them to send emergency services to rescue the children shortly after midnight. Just last week, the city council passed common sense legislation I had introduced to put a GPS on every school bus so parents can track their children just like they've been doing in the chancellor's home city of Houston since 2015. 
Once at school, I believe that if we meet our children's basic needs, they are more likely to become a self-actualized in accordance with Maslow's hierarchy of needs to better guarantee their long-term success. And take that, anyone who ever said my psychology degree wouldn't be worthwhile. <laughs> we should provide our children with food they need through universal school breakfast, lunch, and supper, and providing supervision and mentorship they need from adults through universal after-school and youth jobs. We won a commitment for universal free lunch in 2017, something that our borough president has been working on for years. And now free... Also, our, our state senator, Liz Kruger, has also been working on... Everyone had been working on it for a very long time before I got elected, including our Congress member. But it is something we finally got done. And now that free lunch for every student in New York City is a reality, there's no longer a stigma for those who accept it. The same stigma, stigma that drove me to make the unfortunate decision of refusing free or reduced school lunch when I was a student. In schools, I always loved art. It was one of the only places I could be creative and express myself. That's why each year, my office partners with Sotheby's to bring hundreds of pieces of art from more than a dozen local public schools to hang at our annual art show. Thank you to PS183 parent Patricia Corrigy, Principal Martin Woodard, and art teacher Wan Ling Farr for their partnership. Learning continues beyond school, which is why we secured $3.7 million in capital funding for necessary repairs and technology at the public libraries on Roosevelt Island, 67th Street, and the Webster Branch. And last year, we even broke ground on construction of a brand new $7.8 million library on Roosevelt Island. Like a quality public school education, every New Yorker deserves an affordable home. My constituent services team works with residents every day to keep New Yorkers in their homes, to apply for SCREE and DRE, to keep their rents affordable, and to find new affordable housing. Thanks to brave whistleblower pictured right here at the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development, Steve Warner, we found that owners of 15,000 buildings receiving over $100 million from the city in tax breaks failed to register any affordable units, leaving New Yorkers roughly 50,000 units short of what they were promised. We worked with our whistleblower, ProPublica, and Wall Street Journal reporter Cesare Podkul to author Local Law 64 of 2018 to force developers and landlords who get millions for affordable housing to actually live up to the promise by registering every single unit so we can see where they are and so that low-income New Yorkers can apply for new and existing affordable housing. Since the law passed in late 2017, we worked on implementation of a new Housing Connect website to find and apply for affordable housing that will be as easy to use as Street Easy or Zillow and have a whole lot more housing on it. In recognition for the work we've done around affordable housing, I was appointed chair of the Land Use Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions, which is responsible for approving affordable housing built on city land or with tax abatements. I've been focused on forcing transparency around these projects to get the bottom line of each unit of affordable housing cost the city so we can get more units and more affordability. We've highlighted where affordable housing may gentrifying neighborhoods, where its construction may actually be worsening the crisis by paying construction workers low wages, and we've introduced legislation to uncover conflicts of interest and protect workers on these sites. When the mayor initially announced NYCHA infill, I wanted to ensure that the projects provided adequate funding to support NYCHA were sited in locations that would not leave the poor in the shadows of the rich and would ultimately provide a pathway out of poverty. I have joined our Congress member, Cal Maloney, and Borough President Gail Brewer in opposing the proposed infill at Holmes Towers for being placed on a playground, leaving poor literally in the shadows of wealthy tenants above them while failing to generate even enough money to make repairs needed at the adjacent buildings. They're planning to build a skyscraper, which is in violation of the neighborhood zoning without going through the land use process, which is something that, I, that we will continue to fight. When I first got elected, Congress member Carol Maloney asked me to co-chair the East River Esplanade Task Force with her because it was literally falling into the river, and then it actually did. Since then, we've secured an overseen spending of $200 million in public and private dollars.
This year, after two years of negotiations, we formed a public-private partnership with the Brearley School to invest $1.5 million in the overhang between 82nd and 83rd Streets. The plan includes colorful new designs, contemporary lighting, green walls, new planters, and a partnership with the local conservancy, and construction starts this summer. We also cut a ribbon on a renovated section of the East River Esplanade from 70th to 72nd Street with the latest step in our project with the Hospital for Special Surgery, Rockefeller University, and the Parks Department to completely redo the Esplanade from 62nd Street to 78th Street. This stretch will now feature noise barriers, a water fountain, and irrigation to keep plants alive, new planting beds, improved lighting, repaired railings, new seating and paving, and it will be maintained by our partner institutions in perpetuity. As we invested in the Esplanade, residents raised safety concerns, so although I personally oppose surveillance, we put NYPD security cameras on the participatory budgeting ballot where they won hundreds of votes. Ultimately, we invested $336,000 in security cameras for our hard to patrol parks, transit hubs, and quality of life hotspots. With Rockefeller University, we installed the cameras on new section of the East River Esplanade, and with Council Member Keith Powers, we put cameras in the Sutton area parks and at the request of the 19th Precinct at the 86th Street subway corridor. Our parks are only as nice as we keep them, and we're lucky to have strong conservancies led by Eastsiders who are dedicated to their local parks. I want to thank everybody who helps run or volunteer with these conservancies and partnerships at our local parks, including Carl Schurz Park Conservancy, Friends of St. Catherine Park, Friends of the East River Esplanade, Sutton Place Parks Conservancy, Samuel Seabury Park Conservancy, Muslim Volunteers of New York at Rupert Park, East 79th Street Neighborhood Association at John Jay Park, Green Park Gardeners at Andrew Haswell Green Dog Run, and of course, Upper Greenside. I am also excited to be forming a new partnership with the New York Roller Hockey League at Stanley Isaacs Park. And if anybody wants to start a conservancy for 24 Sycamores Park, I think we will have all of our parks covered. Now, New York City can and must continue to do more to fight overdevelopment and the march of super scrapers into residential neighborhoods. In November 2017, our long fought battle to rezone the Sutton area became law thanks to relentless advocacy and our partnership with my co applicants at the East River 50s Alliance. Borough President Gail Brewer and State Senator Liz Kruger. Although we defeated the planned super tall that would have exceeded 1,000 feet tall, last year the Board of Standards and Appeals grandfathered a proposed 800-foot skyscraper under the old zoning. So I sued the city and the New York State Supreme Court alongside and representing the East River 50s Alliance with noted attorney Michael Hiller, where so far a judge has ordered the developer who has agreed to build the building in compliance with the new zoning law we passed as the case is being decided. I want to thank the East River 50s Alliance led by Alan Kirsch, Robert Schepler, Lisa Mercurio, Jessica Osborne, with local heroes like Herndon Wirth, Charles Fernandez, and more than 400 individual members. Please join the fight at irfa.nyc slash donate. You can do it now on your mobile phones, seriously. Throughout Manhattan, we're seeing buildings that had previously been in contact with one another shooting up in height thanks to series of zoning loopholes. You can see example right here. Perhaps the most common loophole is voids, which are essentially empty floors that don't get counted against the building's height, giving buyers of expensive apartments at the top of the building views over the rest of us. I funded the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts to research how to close these loopholes. And after our advocacy at our mayoral town hall last January, the mayor promised to reform these loopholes. That promise has not yet been fully completed, but we are making progress on ensuring our city's zoning leads to predictable development. Every year since I took office, we have brought participatory budgeting to the district where students 11 years old and over voted on how to spend discretionary capital dollars from my office. Last year, PS290 won $200,000 for reconstruction of vital infrastructure. The New York Public Library and District won $200,000 for technology and computer upgrades. And 10 schools won laptops for $350,000. Altogether, since I've been in office, we've invested $3.1 million in green roofs and $3.8 million in computers, smart boards, and science labs. Since the passage of ballot question one in November, participatory budgeting expanding beyond my council district citywide. 
As council member, every once in a while, we get to do work that will literally save lives. Anyone here ever read our newsletter? Okay, I mean the whole thing cover to cover. Wow. Well, you're in good company with Kathleen Steed. She found a free cancer screening in our newsletter, detected it early, and beat cancer. <laughs> Thank you to Josh Jameson, who just lost any hope of shortening it, for drafting our newsletter and our community partners for providing so many free programs for our newsletter, and to Kathleen Steed for giving us far more credit than we ever deserved, and most importantly, for fighting cancer and winning. Now, following a cluster of Legionnaires disease on the east side, I changed city policy so that we clean all towers that test positive for the Legionella bacteria rather than waiting until it develops into Legionnaires disease. When WNYC found that many towers were out of compliance with the law, we authored legislation to improve inspections reporting so we can prevent any more deaths from Legionnaires disease. And while Queen Elizabeth II banned single-use water bottles across England's royal estates in an effort to be more environmentally friendly, President Trump rolled back regulations that had been protecting our national parks. That's why I introduced legislation to ban the sale of single-use plastic bottles in city-owned parks and open spaces. We're still working with PS290 and the Sierra Club and local activists to ban the use of toxic pesticides in city parks and are working on a stronger version of the legislation. And I continue to park, I continue to support plastic bag diversion, and I'm disappointed that it was blocked in Albany. In the meantime, you can get your reusable bag from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer or from us at the end of the event, and make sure to bring it with you when you shop for groceries. As we discuss the environment and health, I have to make sure I address the Marine Transfer Station. During the last five years, we've stood our ground against the mayor and his MTS, and have won several concessions that will help the community. I remain opposed to the construction of this facility with our Congress member, our Senator, our Assembly member, our Borough President, and anyone with a right mind, and uh, the impact it will have on our community. For that reason, we fought, and so far we've exposed high costs. We've ensured that any zoned trash pickup will not be tied to tipping at our Marine Transfer Station, exposed the dangers of sanitation trucks, winning funding for guardrails on every truck, introduced legislation mandating and won a commitment to zero waste to make marine transfer to landfill obsolete by 2030. A new ramp will be constructed one block north in partnership with the Pledge to Protect and local community to protect children from all over the city who play at Asphalt Green. I even co-sponsored and passed a waste equity law that will protect our neighborhood from receiving more than 10% of the city's waste. The initial version of this bill exempted districts with marine transfer stations from the cap. I was able to negotiate this exemption out of the bill in exchange for my support, and I'm now confident it will protect the Upper East Side from getting more trucks than planned. Most recently, as reported in Our Town, following a letter I sent to the Department of Sanitation, we learned that the neighborhood is going from having 200 trucks a day at the sanitation garage on 74th Street to an average of 40 to 50 trucks per day. Our neighborhood saw a such a dramatic reduction because our neighborhood is producing 25% less trash than it was 10 years ago by using, thing by using fewer single-use plastic bottles, reusable bag, and composting. So please help me reduce the number of trucks coming to our neighborhood by signing up for textile and electronic recycling or composting for your building. On the transport... On the transportation front, as many of you know, we have a convenient New York City ferry stop in Roosevelt Island that opened in 2017. 2018, we took that a step further and cut the ribbon on a city ferry right here on the Upper East Side on 90th Street. The ferry shuttles anywhere between 150 to 200,000 riders every week. The new routes are an asset to our city, and I'm proud to have advocated for their service. We've also expanded select bus service, winning it for 86th Street and then replicating that success at 79th Street. We're fighting alongside our borough president, Gail Brewer, for service on 96th Street to speed up that crosstown commute. With ferry service and select bus service combined with the Second Avenue subway, something that our Congress members secured billions of dollars to fund and got it built. <laughs> Along with city bike and miles of bike lanes in the district, we've had a lot easier to get around a neighborhood that used to be known as a transportation desert. Now everybody, 
whether pedestrian, cyclist, or driver should feel safe on our streets. With our bike safety program, we have ensured that improved bike lane on 2nd Avenue to close the gap, provided pedestrian and bike lane crossing at 59th Street and the Queensboro Bridge, added bike lanes and leading pedestrian intervals and safety neck downs to make it easier to cross the street. Along with our education program, the NYPD has also increased enforcement, writing 1,749 summonses to bicyclists in 2018, combined with 81 seizures of e-bikes. And if you see or experience a dangerous intersection where you had a close call, please report it to my office so we can make our streets safer for you and everybody else at bencalos.com slash livable streets. Since transportation issues have improved in our neighborhood, we've been able to continue to focus on improving quality of life. One of the most obvious ways we've done that is by making our streets cleaner. Thanks to 322 large covered trash cans on every corner of the district, purchased with funding from my office and twice a day pickup by the Department of Sanitation, our busy streets and intersections have been cleaner. However, last month, I allocated an additional $85,000 so that Wildcat Services sends three-person crews four days a week focused on sweeping sidewalks and bike islands, cleaning gutters and drains of blockages, and removing litter from tree pits. This is a pilot program that, if successful and so far so good, would greatly improve the appearance of our neighborhood. Thank you to Andrew Fine, who has made it a point of coming to every policy night and on social media about where we need to clean up. I also want to thank Susan Gottridge. Both of them are from the East 86th Street Neighborhood Association as well as Valerie Mason uh, from the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association for being supportive of these efforts. Because East 96th Street train stations see more than 20 million visitors a year, ultimately goal is to have a business improvement district for the East 86th Street Business Corridor. It's the only way we will get it to shape that it deserves to be. A bid here will help with daily street sweeping and support for our local businesses. You can help clean up East 86th Street by getting your favorite business and their landlord to share their support at bencalos.com slash bid slash support. New York City continues to struggle with a crisis of homelessness. As of New Year's Day, 22,463 children woke up in a shelter. They woke up with their 16,948 parents, 5,400 adult families, 11,831 single men, 4,471 single women, and an estimated 3,892 people on our streets. To take on this issue in 2016, I launched the Eastside Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services with Senator Liz Kruger and Borough President Gail Brewer, convening local churches, synagogues, and nonprofits with city agencies, and we're devoted to one key goal, building supportive housing in the district to help the homeless. We've been, we've been proud to break ground on East 91st Street for 17 two-bedroom supportive homes for women in need, led by former P Speaker Qu Chris Quinn, alongside Social, Social Services Commissioner Steve Banks, Congressmember Maloney, Borough President Brewer, Senator Kruger, Assemblymember Seawright, Community Board 8, Rector and now Bishop of Arizona, Jennifer Reddle of the Church of the Epiphany, and student leaders from PS 527 and Eastside School for Social Action, as well as Eastside Middle School. Uh, I'll also note that Rita Popper lives across the street, and she said yes in my backyard, along with David Rosenstein, who lives on the same block. And this is the way we should be building. We hope to get every unsheltered person living on the street the help they need. If you see one of our city's most vulnerable on the street, please call 311 or use the NYC 311 app to ask them to dispatch a homeless outreach team. They'll ask where you saw the person, what they looked like, and offer to report back to you on whether the person accepts the city offer of shelter, three meals a day, health care, rehabilitation, and job training. Please consider financially supporting or volunteering with our ethos partners in their direct services to help those who are less fortunate. One of the most important ways of preventing homelessness is hunger, to make sure New Yorkers are actually getting the benefits they qualify for. That's why I authored automatic benefits legislation that would use information government already has to provide the benefits residents need automatically. The city agreed to perform in examining the study and the feasibility of this proposal and the best way to get benefits directly in need. We have been working with the administration on the study and are excited for it to come out this year. In a city where one in four homes in Brooklyn does not have broadband, rising to one in three in the Bronx. I'm proud to have advocated and won alongside public advocate and now Attorney General Tish James for internet assist from Spectrum and Altice, which provides 30 megabit high-speed broadband for only $14.99 a month to households with students receiving free or reduced school lunch or seniors on supplemental social security income. 
This has the power to bridge the digital divide by bringing affordable, high-speed internet to more than 1.2 low-income New Yorkers. In addition to universal broadband, finding and making tens of thousands of units of affordable housing available and increasing access to food, we must also help every New Yorker retire. As an attorney who practiced ERISA, I'm proud to lend my expertise to legislation authored by public advocate Tish James that I'm proud to carry that provide two million New York City residents without any retirement savings with an auto enrollment payroll deduction retirement security for all Roth IRA. Despite the Trump administration seeking to stop us, this week Bill de Blasio announced support for this vital legislation in his state of the city. New York City should be a place where you can raise a family with universal child care, 3K, pre-K, and the best schools in the world serving three square meals a day with universal after school and youth jobs, free higher education with affordable housing to live here, easy commutes, beautiful parks, and an unparalleled quality of life. All part of a city that works seamlessly and proactively for you. We spent the past five years, 12 days, 14 hours, 13 minutes, and 10 seconds uh, working tirelessly to accomplish these goals. I have two years, 11 months, 17 days, nine hours, and uh, 16 minutes left. And sorry, the, the math is harder on this part. 25 seconds as your council member. Let's use that time wisely on worthy goals that we can accomplish now to make our city and the world around us a better place. Please consider joining our effort at benkalos.com volunteer. Thank you for your partnership and joining us today.